Hello everyone. I'm Archana Pai Kulkarni and I welcome you all to the sixth digital edition of SheThePeople.tv's Women Writers Fest. Today I have the pleasure and privilege of being in conversation with Arundhati Subramaniam. Arundhati, a big welcome to you. It's a pleasure Thank to you. have you. Lovely to be here, Archana, particularly since we go back such a long way. And I have <laughs> wonderful recollections of uh, you publishing several of my articles when I was one of those young, starving poets. So thank you. That was a pleasure too. And so I'll begin with an introduction. One of the finest poets writing in India today, Arundhati Subramaniam is the award-winning author of 12 books of poetry and prose. And an as prose writer, her work includes the Book of Buddha and the best-selling biography of a contemporary mystic, Sadhguru, More Than a Life. She has worked over the years as poetry editor, curator, and critic. Her book, When God is a Traveler, won the Sahitya Academy Award 2020, was the season choice of the Poetry Book Society UK and was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2015. She is the recipient of various prestigious awards and fellowships. Arundhati's new book is titled Women Who Wear Only Themselves, Conversations with Four Travelers on Sacred Journeys. Arundhati, congratulations on winning the Sahitya Academy Award and on your new book. Thanks. So may I request you to begin by reciting or reading a couple of poems from When God is a Traveler? Happy to, happy to. Is there any particular poem you want? Or do I have a choice? choice. Do I, yes. do I you make have a decision? choice. Of course, you have a choice. So since you and I and our journeys actually uh, converged initially, Archana, in Bombay, Mumbai, yes. the city of the yes. Yes. I'm going to read a poem called The City and I. I thought I'd read yes. that. It's yes. a poem about returning to the city after 26 November 2008, after those horrific uh, terrorist attacks. It's a city that I've always thought of as a bully, a mean-spirited adversarial city. But I think uh, this was one moment, where I remember the moment, returning from the airport and suddenly feeling a sense of kinship with the city itself. Okay. The city and I. This time, we didn't circle each other, the city and I. This time, there was space between us and we weren't competing. Space enough and more for the nose digging librarian and her stainless steel tiffin box, for the little theater peon to read me endless Marathi poems on rainy afternoons, for the woman on the 710 Bhayandar slow to say and say again, he's coming to get me, he's coming. This time, the city surged towards me, mangy, bruised eyed, non-vaccinated, suddenly mine. Thank One more? Thank I you think so much. this is fine. Let's move into the conversation. Okay. If something comes up organically, I'll, I'll read a poem for you. Sure, sure. Uh, see, the word traveler features in the titles of two of your books and in quite a few of your conversations. You've also edited uh, an anthology titled Pilgrims India. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned that you need travel, that it's, it's a very important part of your life. So what is it about travel that fascinates you? And I'm talking not just the physical, about the physical part, part of travel. I'm talking also about the figurative, figuratively yes. and mm. what travel means. It's, it's a good question, Ajna. I suppose, on, you know, one can travel as a tourist. You can travel to, uh, you know, as many do, notching up uh, frequent flyer miles and, you know, the more glamorous forms of travel. And you can also travel as a pilgrim, which is yes, a sense of quest. You can't quite put your finger on what that quest is and you can't quite put your finger on what you're looking for. But there is a sense of quest that fuels uh, the need to travel. It could be a basic existential unease or even just a homesickness, the kind of homesickness that you can't quite understand. So I think I've known what it's like to be afflicted by that kind of uh, 
an essential restlessness. I remember feeling this very strongly, particularly I would say around uh, the early part of, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I remember it being intense. I had a Greek poet friend who said that travel sometimes is just about going away in order to return and find that you need to move your armchair just an inch away from the window, just so that you have another angle, another perspective on the world. And I think sometimes it's about as small a shift as that, but it's a significant shift. So I've known what it's like to be a quester. I've known what it's like to be a thirsty uh, traveler. And in my last book, When God is a Traveler, which I just read from, there's a whole cycle of poems about a mythic traveler. There are real travelers in the book, like Mrs. Salim Sheikh, a woman whom one, one might encounter on a Bombay local. And there is also the mythic traveler there in the book called Sh that is Shakuntala. And I see Shakuntala as the kind of traveler who's perennially looking for home. And she's never quite sure if her home, at least in my poems, she's never quite sure if her home is the hermitage or the court, whether it's forest or whether it's city, whether it's earth or whether it's sky. That's because of her mixed parentage. She's really never quite sure. And it took me all those eight poems, I had to write them to realize that that is in fact the human predicament. We are between, we are hyphens between flesh and spirit, if you will. And uh, that can be seen as a liability, that can be seen as a conflict, but it can also be seen as a tremendous possibility. We are the bridge. That is how important we are. So I think there's been a shift in the kind of travel that happens in my poems as well. The most recent book, Love Without a Story, my recent, most recent book of poetry, has the old woman poet Abayar. She's a traveler too in these poems, but she's a different kind of traveler. She's no longer looking for a purpose. She's no longer looking for a point. She knows that the point is just campfire, conversation, a shared fruit, laughter, that there's no sadly or happily ever after. She's enjoying the journey. So do you feel at home anywhere in the world? It's a good question too. Let me see how to answer that. I'd say, Archana, for many years I didn't and the travel was propelled by a great uh, restlessness. I felt homeless for a good decade in my life. And now I'd say I actually feel I have multiple homes each of which reflects an important part of me and um, allows me to express a certain part of myself. So I'm very grateful for that. Now, during the last few months, we've all been cloistered, right? Mm -hmm. We've led a very... So um, what I wanted to know is uh, you've had probably more time for reflection, right? And yes. maybe observation also because you haven't been... But how do you do that? from home. I know it's, it's a tough one, particularly for chronic travelers. But I think it's also been very good for me, Arjuna. It's been good because I think and this is, seems to be the way it is for so many people. It's allowed us to engage in a kind of internal spring cleaning that we might not have engaged in otherwise. And it's been hard. You're absolutely right about that. But it's also been a time of self reclamation in a way, you know, acknowledging parts of the self that one had um, perhaps postponed confronting. So I think that's been good. I'm grateful for it. It also gave me time to work on uh, material that I hadn't looked at for a very long time. Most recently, the book, Women Who Wear Only Themselves. It wouldn't have happened had I not had this prolonged period of quiet. Mm -hmm. So did you find yourself turning to a certain kind of books during the pandemic or yearning to write about something that is maybe life affirming, inspiring, healing? Did you feel compelled to write something like that? You know, what I was intensely aware of, Arjuna, during this time is the fact that there were parts of me or parts of, um, there were just areas of inquiry for me that I wasn't, acknowledging adequately. And I felt I've done it to a great degree in my poetry, but I felt the need to acknowledge 
uh, a certain kind of conversation because I wasn't hearing it around me sufficiently. I was just hearing a kind of blaze of acrimony and recrimination on social media. And I was here uh, on which I'm not, uh, I'm not too active on it, but it, one, it percolates into our lives. And I was hearing blame games and I was hearing uh, reactivity, a kind of forming reactivity. What I was not hearing are quieter conversations about journeys, about self-discovery. And so part of the reason for this most recent book was really a need to acknowledge the journeys of quieter travelers, those who aren't uh, documented, yes. those who aren't, they're the unsung travelers, in a sense. I wanted to talk to them. I wanted space for the measured conversation. I wanted space for pauses, for quiet. I wanted space for all of that. I wanted space above all for wonder. You know, and for me, this book was a chance to do that. So what are you reading now? What am I reading now? Um, by my bedside right now is a book called uh, Passionate Enlightenment by Miranda Shaw. It's a book on uh, women in tantric uh, Buddhism. That's, That's what I mean. Really okay. And uh, who are the new poetic voices that you find engaging? Oh, there, are, there are just so many, Archana. One of the things I have done in this time is to read a lot of new manuscripts from younger poets. And um, I've also been reading, because I've been uh, on the jury of some competitions, I've been reading many younger voices. So there are several names that come to mind, but I'd say for now, among the younger voices, I'd say Urvashi Bahuguna, I'd say Shohini Basak, and a voice that I just discovered during one particular competition that I judged a young woman called Avni Tandon Vieira. So I look forward to just hearing more of her work. There are too many to name, really. I've How also been reading uh, Sumana Roy. You know, there are okay. many, many writers whose, uh, you know, work keeps coming into my life, yeah. How does a poem, poem take shape on your page? What fuels your art? What does it all begin with? Often with a phrase. Um, often with just the need, you know, on a certain day that you just have to sit and make uh, space for a poem, you know, you know, you have to do that. And you allow, there's a question of allowing the poem rather than simply doing it. So it has to be that kind of tension between uh, magic and manual labor that needs to go into that, uh, that you need to allow. It needs, it, there is a kind of creative tension between doing and allowing. That's part of it, but it usually starts with a phrase, a line. But I'd say increasingly, yeah. um, Archana, it's been about writing fragments and those fragments accumulate over time. And suddenly I look back on it and I realize that there are many connections that I had missed um, when I was actually writing them. So that's how they, they work as a kind of mosaic. So does it ever happen them. that uh, you you have that one line and that one idea and it takes you to say three different places and you end up with three different drafts and then you are a little, you know, you're wondering what to do with it. Does that ever happen to you? I know. Poems always ask to go in directions that you never anticipate. So one part of it is to allow it to happen, you know, because you are meant to be surprised by your poem as well. Uh, sometimes your poem may actually be begging to morph into three separate poems. Maybe that's what's waiting to happen. I'd say when that happens, you know, when you sense a poem tugging in different directions, it's a good idea to stop, put it away and return to it. Return to it when you've forgotten about it, not when you've been actively gnawing at it. Put it away, forget about it, return to it. And you'll see that one draft strikes you as that much more startling but also that much more true when that happens you know you're on the right track oh okay your new book women who wear only themselves was born out of a thirst for conversations with women especially contemporary women seekers mm. and you have been talking to other seekers you have been talking to your guru you have been having these conversations but yet you felt that there was something that was missing so what was missing and what were you expecting to unearth that you hadn't found before i'd say 
I've been very, uh, as I said, I feel very lucky to have had the kind of conversations that have come my way, some of which have moved into books of their own. But what I did miss was hearing the way in which a woman articulates, a woman seeker articulates her journey. Now, many, many years ago, when I was in university, actually, I remember reading this line from a feminist theologian. Uh, she said in her, in this essay, it, this was a, a person called Valerie Saving Goldstein, mm -hmm. the scholar. She says that if on a spiritual journey, the, the obstacle for a male seeker is often arrogance or pride or, you know, we're told the importance of subduing the ego and so on. She says for a woman, it is often something quite different. And she says it is often the need to look to others for her self-definition. And that is often the biggest stumbling block. Now, this line stayed with me because it rang very true. Uh, it resonated with something that I, I could, I, I, I sensed the truth of it without quite knowing what it meant. But many years later, I realized, particularly as I was working with the anthology of Bhakti poetry, that the whole idea of bhakti, of devotion, does it mean surrender? And hasn't the word surrender been used indiscriminately and used in all kinds of oppressive ways, particularly with regard to women in all cultures? Almost every spiritual tradition enjoins surrender. But what does the surrender mean? If you're being asked to surrender a self that you've never really owned, what does it mean? So I was interested, these were questions that seemed to be arising organically in my conversations. So I wanted, this is perhaps one of the mainsprings of the book. The other was just the women themselves, the fact that they happened and those conversations happened. But I found that many of the conversations were circling this central question of what does it mean to be a woman on the path? The destination may be gender neutral, but the journey, given that we are all socialized differently, can the journey ever really be gender neutral? These were some of the questions I think implicit in this book. So is it tougher for women? I don't know if I would say it's tougher. I think every seeker, I, life isn't easy for any seeker. So I, wouldn't, uh, I don't want to make a value judgment about easier or more difficult, but I'd say it's definitely different. And if we were to read many of the earlier women, you know, women mystics of the past and their poetry, we know that they were up against social uh, incomprehension of the magnitude that we cannot imagine today. So in some ways, it's perhaps easier for today's um, woman seeker. But I'd say it's definitely different. And many of these women have had to negotiate ridicule, trivialization, um, marginalization, all kinds of things that I think men perhaps uh, don't quite deal with. They have another set of challenges. You know, really discovering yourself, coming to terms with yourself, coming home to yourself is a journey that is full of challenges for everyone. So I don't want to take that away. The idea is not to set up um, women against, um, women seekers against male seekers as much as it is a need to include as many voices as possible. You know, I think uh, as a seeker myself, I've known many other seekers who are just thirsty to hear of other journeys. That's all. Wherever yes. they come from. Uh, Arundhati, you have spoken about a near-death experience that you underwent, I think, in 1997, if I'm not wrong. And you also mentioned how words, poetry, love, books failed to fill the emptiness that gripped you. And I believe the internal change was pretty seismic, right? So has it affected the way you write? And if so, how? I'd say it's affected how I write, for sure. It's uh, affected the way in which I would craft a poem. It's affected... Um, it's affected the how more than the what. But every time I say that, I also know that's not entirely true because uh, many of the books that I have written, give, particularly the book of Bhakti poetry, uh, more recently, women who wear only themselves, none of these would perhaps have happened if I hadn't known what it was like to be uh, really bewildered, sometimes terrified seeker a seeker who was willing to swallow her pride and look for answers wherever they came from. 
And uh, that was not an easy thing to do. It was, uh, at the time it was hard, but I knew I had to do it. So I think a lot of the, the areas of preoccupation have certainly been uh, shaped by that experience. Does the mundane still interest you, Arundhati? <laughs> Absolutely. As I say, you know, when people say, have you turned into some kind of spiritual poet? And I always say, I don't even know what that means. What I do know is that um, I need to be writing about orange lunch boxes. I need to be writing about the woman on the 710 by Ander Slow who says, uh, he's coming to get me, he's coming. I need to be writing about the nose digging librarian and her stainless steel stiffen box. I need to be writing about all that too. So it's not, I think the most important thing, Archana, this I think, I, I'm glad we've come to this because it's the crux of it, as I see it, is that we really don't have to be just one thing or the other. The great possibility of hu being human is that we can be both. So we don't, it's not an either or thing. We are as much flesh as we are spirit and there has to be room for both. It's just about, I think the problem sometimes in the worlds that we inhabit and I say worlds because really these are multiple worlds that we're living in, is that we are encouraged to either over accentuate one or the other. So Shakuntala in my poem of the past felt she had to choose between hermitage and court. I don't think Shakuntala has to choose. Shakuntala is the bridge between both. She doesn't have to choose between the this worldly and the otherworldly. Shakuntala is the axis between both. So the mundane is the mystical also. I suppose can it can be. I mean, I think some of the finest poets uh, have reminded us of that, haven't they? I was just talking to someone about Arun Koletkar's Kalaghora poems, where he speaks of idlis and the stars in the same breath. You know? So I think the finest poets have always reminded us of that. And you don't have to be an avowedly uh, sacred poet for that yes that was lovely now being a seeker as you mentioned is a tough terrain to navigate uh, because the mere whiff of the word spirituality invites knee-jerk scorn have you ever found yourself on the back foot or have you felt compelled to shield yourself from the derision and the infantilizing that comes a seeker's way and if so what gave you the courage to come out of the closet, so to say, because I know many seekers who are terrified of mentioning that they're seekers. Yes. It is tough, uh, Archana, but I didn't come out of the closet because of any courage, I don't think. I think I came out of the closet simply because I had to. I had believed that um, I could inhabit different parts of myself and keep them all neatly compartmentalized. But uh, there came a time in my life, and it actually goes into a poem that is uh, included in When God is a Traveler. There came a time in my life, I say in the poem, when I opened a coffee percolator and found that my roof had flown off. That was my inner experience at the time. So you can't then just be humming in your kitchen. You have to sing to the stars. You know, there is a difference between when ceilings fly off and uh, the ground under your feet suddenly seems uh, more wobbly than ever before. So things changed and I think I was plunged into places that I had never quite uh, dreamt of. Not to acknowledge that would have been dishonest. It would have been impossible. Let me just say that would have been impossible. It would have to show up in the way I wrote, in what I wrote. It was bound to show up. So I don't think it was courage as much as uh, it could be no other way. And I realize now that the, any journey of inner discovery is about becoming a less divided being. So you may want to keep your closet separate from your living room and the living room separate from your bedroom. But really, when walls start crumbling, it's not so easy. Do you worry that your work may be seen through a biased lens? Because there are these advocates of reason who are wont to probably misread your seeking as religious affiliation. And then there are also those trolls who have begun to consider poetry as dangerous. Very recently, mm. uh, Kishani Doshi was trolled for one of her poems. So in this kind of a scenario, do you feel free to write or do you pause and wonder whether you should go ahead or whether you should edit yourself or hold back? 
do you feel free? Mm -hmm. um, I, did, I don't know about the particular poem that she was trolled for, but I'll say with regard to my own work, you can be perceived in innumerable ways, uh, uh, Archana, and you can be perceived that way from, you know, you're navigating a path. This I'm very conscious of, that I'm navigating a path between religious orthodoxy, which is also not very forgiving, Mm -hmm. yes, and it's not. Uh, it's not and a certain kind of um, blistering uh, rationality which is also not forgiving so you're trying to find a path between these extremes and essentially as I look at it I think what one is trying to do is to find a path in a world of great dogmatism and a world of great jingoism we find this in our religious sphere we find this yes. in our cultural sphere we find this in our political sphere it's always either or and any kind of binarizing is something that poetry, at least, there are times you may take a very strong stand. I'm not saying it's against taking stands, but the language of poetry is the language of uncertainty. It's a language of, you're, you're not using ready-made language. You're using, for, me, for the poet, you're trying to discover language even as you compose. So if we take away that quality from poetry, I think we will lose something very vital. We may have a lot of, uh, kosher sociology, but we won't have startling sensuousness, which is also an important in ingredient of poetry. So I'd say it is a journey. And am I worried about it? No, but I'm certainly very conscious of it. And I know that one always runs the risk of being um, yes. perceived in one way or the other. Does one stop for that reason? I hope not. I hope not. I hope somewhere people are able to sniff, or at least some are able to sniff out authenticity when they encounter it. That's very the whole lovely. reason for doing this book, for instance, Women Who Wear Only Themselves, was not because I know anything about these women's spiritual attainments. It was just that I, I sensed the authenticity of that exchange. If I hadn't sensed that, that this conversation was real, maybe the facts aren't real, Maybe I don't know everything there is to know. It's not a researched book. But yes, yes. this conversation, the texture of this conversation was real. Yes, and I've read the book and it's extremely interesting, let me tell you. You have mentioned that both the spiritual and creative are invitations to listen deep and hard and attentively to the world around and within you. Now, would you say uh, that the processes that you practice, and I'm assuming you do, as you're a seeker, maybe nature walks, yoga, meditation, dance, mm -hmm. have they played a role in the honing of your receptivity? Do you see what others can't see? And is this routine fundamental now? Can you do without it? There are two questions there. One is the kind of sadhana that is part of yes. one's life. Yes, yes. And I'd say whoever, I mean, anyone who is on a journey, there has to be a sadhana. There has to be riyas of some kind. And whatever that riyas is and whatever works for you. For me, it has to be a nonverbal practice because my work is around words. So a nonverbal, for me, a breath-based practice has worked wonderfully. It could be something different for, different, for someone else. Yes. But I'd say that's an integral part of my life. Absolutely integral, and I wouldn't give it away for anything. Mm -hmm. It is the spine of my life. That's what it's become. But do I see something that others won't see? That sounds for me, I mean, if I were to say that, it sounds terribly grandiose and I wouldn't uh, make that claim. But what I would say, what I would say is that if you simply allow yourself to observe without being in a hurry to reach for a conclusion, and if you were to simply listen without being in a hurry to arrive at a judgment, you actually end up listening to life itself. And that is the reward. That is really the only reward of being a listener. When I say life itself, you're just more tuned into the way things are rather than the way your mind thinks they ought to be. And that tuning is worth it. It is a subtle but deeply pleasurable journey towards yourself. Put it very beautifully. Um, you have known Devi as inner experience. Can you tell us more on the divine feminine that has been your ally and the voice of your heart? 
who is Devi? Archana, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> it's a hard one because um, there are some kinds of conversations that are actually best had in poetry because um, it's difficult to talk. For me, my personal goddess is Linga Bhairavi. And she's a very particular, very local goddess. And the wonderful thing I think um, that has been made possible and the Bhakti movements remind us of that is the fact that you can have your own very local neighborhood god or goddess. Basically your own device, whatever you want to call it. A device that unlocks your, your door, your portal to the larger world of discovery. So your portal to the universe. For me, my portal to my universe is Devi. Who is she and how do I know her as inner experience? I would actually quote a poem. It's, this is a one line poem, which I will share with you, which is from my most recent book. It's, um, it says this, it's addressed, it's dedicated to Linga Bhai Devi. It says, in her burning rainforest, silence is so alive, you can hear listening. I think that's who she is. An intense, alive, distilled, powerful listening. How do you view the current surge of poetry on social media platforms? And I know that you're just an occasional tourist there, but yes. there was a time when uh, you know poetry was considered the domain of an elitist few. And now mm -hmm. people are worried about the democratization, if you will, because they say, mm. well, everyone's writing poetry. How can everyone write poetry? And what do you feel about this? I feel, you know, everyone should write poetry if they're so inclined, as everyone should sing if they're so inclined. And I'm all for it. But uh, I sing too. But I try to make sure it's restricted to bathroom singing. You know, so I'd say that before you, before you pick up the mic, it's a good idea to also make sure that you, you stand by what you're putting out there to some degree. Some will like it, some won't. That's always the way it's going to be. But it's important to know why you're doing what you're doing. I didn't always know, and I've uh, fumbled and blundered myself. But I think um, what does happen when you work on your craft, over a period of time is you begin to also become a different kind of reader of poetry. You become a different kind of listener and you begin to have a sense of what constitutes a working poem. So I'd say I'm all for democratization, but along with it, there needs to be a spirit of uh, self-critique and there needs to be craft. There needs to be a constant riyaz. Whatever you do, sadhana has to be part of it. So what is good poetry, Arundhati? Would you I'd say, I'm, I'm, I'd say I would certainly, I do certainly have an idea of what constitutes my idea of what constitutes a good poem. I do. And I would hold on to my ideas of good and bad poetry, but I'm also willing to be, um, I'm willing to shift my ideas of what constitutes a good poem when something comes my way for which I have no ready uh, label, but which I recognize as beautiful and true. What is a good poem? For me, something that is, that aligns passion and verbal precision. The two have to go together. When those are aligned, when you sense that this is language that is both um, deeply grounded, sensual, and at the same time, yearning to leap off a page, when it is language that is that seems absolutely deeply familiar, almost inevitable, and at the same time startling. This kind of alignment, when that happens, you know you're in the presence of a poem. But I'd say it's important to have ideas of good and bad poetry, but knowing all the time that you're not infallible. These ideas are not infallible. I think that keeps me going. I think that brings us to a very important question because, uh, well, you've written about the tenacious belief of the word, and I quote, the word I spells artistic adolescence or worse, that it is the resort of neurotic women poets. Okay. 
your vehement that the first person singular is, and I put again, a tremendous archaeological implement, a tool of political and spiritual power, depth, and illumination. So why do you think it is time to reclaim it without apology? And how do we do it? Because most of my poems begin with an I, and I'm terrified. No, I don't think there's any reason to be terrified about that. I think part of the reason for that particular essay that you're referring to was the fact that I was increasingly struck by this. Um, the fact that if it was a young woman poet who was writing about the banyan tree in her grandmother's backyard, then she was yes. writing about some very narrow uh, domestic canvas. Yes. But if a male writer was writing about the banyan tree in his grandmother's backyard, it was a metaphor for some universal truth and the collapse of civilizations and so on. So I think I was really trying to implicate the ways in which we read and the ways in which we often belittle uh, the use of the first person singular, particularly depending on where it comes from. I've seen a woman being uh, patted on her back for moving, graduating, we were told. The word was used was graduating. You graduated from the I to the we, which the suggestion there was that in some way you've now grown up. I feel this kind of paternalistic uh, literary criticism really is something we need to look at because the I is a very supple and wonderful um, device. And as we know, I mean, philosophically as well, the I can be everything. And the I can also refer to the deeply personal. And if you were to ever look for proof of this, you'd find it in the Bhakti poets, you know, who talk of the I with impunity. And the same I can be the world, the universe itself, and the same I can be this very singular individual arguing with her God. So the possibilities of the I, I think, are tremendous. And for me, I've certainly seen it as, a, as, an, as, a, as I say, as an archaeological implement. It's allowed me to widen. It's allowed my gaze to widen immeasurably. It doesn't have to be narrow navel gazing at all, at all. What would you tell aspiring poets, Arundhati, and what would you tell aspiring seekers? I don't think it's aspiring poets want any uh, advice. Well, I'm sure uh, they do because I'm not experience. so sure. Yeah. But let me just say, I'd say to them, you know, keep uh, keep writing, but don't forget to keep reading. You know, depending on who it is, one would say something different. To some, I would say, make sure you work a little more on notions of rigor. Be strenuous with yourself, you know. It, this is not about, oh, I had a, a wonderful moment and I'm going to immediately transpose it on the page and then put it out there. Work on it. And that can be very rewarding and pleasurable for you. I'd say that to some people. To some others who are just afflicted by chronic self-doubt, I'd say, believe in it. Stay with it. It's worth doing, you know. So I'd say, to, I'd say perhaps different things, but to both, I'd say keep reading, keep writing, keep the faith. And don't allow, uh, a poet is not some appellation that you, you know, conferred on yourself and feel you've arrived. It's an ongoing journey for each of us. So you don't become a poet because you published a book. That's what I say to poets. And uh, to seekers, I'd say, my God, you need, um, oh gosh. Stay with the journey, any journey that is true, that is born of a genuine exploratory impulse will not go unrewarded, but you've got to stay the course. That's what I'd say. And don't be in a hurry to judge. Uh, I've done a lot of this in the past, you know, judged and dis dismissed. Um, every path may not be for you, but that doesn't mean one has to be dismissive either. Stay, watch, observe, learn, marinate. This I'd say to both seekers and poets, marinate in something that draws you. And that's the best kind of learning there is. That's wonderful, Arundhati. And I think we have almost come to the end of the session. So may I request mm -hmm. you to read a poem from women who wear themselves, Arundhati? Well, as you know, it's mainly a book of essays, but... Um, what it you does have is poems punctuating it. Yes, I could. Is there 
perhaps just the beginning, or maybe a poem is often the best way to conclude. So let me read a poem called The Monk. And that's actually from my book, When God, uh, not When God is a Traveler, it's from Love Without a Story. Okay. The Monk. It's also in this particular book. It's used in uh, women who wear only themselves. The Monk, who's been in silence 16 years, writes me a note at a yak tea stall skirted by ragged prayer flags in a gray hiccuping wind on the road to Kailash. His face is scarp and fisher and gleaming teeth. He spends each day cleaning his shrine. It's worth it, he laughs. I clean the shrine, it cleans me. He was a spare parts dealer in a time he barely remembers before he was tripped up by something that felt like a granite mountain in reverse, the deepest pothole he's ever known. Too deep to be called love. That turned him into a spare part himself, utterly dispensable, wildly unemployed. And if there is another lifetime, this is what I'd ask for, he says. Same silence, same cleaning. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for talking to SheThePeople.tv. It's been a wonderful conversation. I Thank totally you, Achina, for just the 